time. Hello, I'm Joan Gittens. I'm a professor emerita of history at Southwest Minnesota State University. And I um, have teach, among other things, American women's history. So this is a subject near and dear to me. I'm pleased to be making this um, film on the night before the 100th anniversary of the vote that the um, August 18th was the day that the state of Tennessee, by a squeaker, passed the vote. And then it, it was certified on August 26th, which is known as Equality Day. So we'll be celebrating both days. Um, and in honor of that, I wanted to give a, uh, I hope, short talk on um, the question of um, how women won the vote. What I wanted to focus on, because there's so much information, is the question of really why it took so long. And before I get into that, let me say that there's a wonderful um, public television show, An American Experience, called The Vote. It's four hours long, so you might not want to watch all of it at once, but it's excellent. And it does a lot of what I'm not going to do so much of tonight, and that is talk about some specific women who were whose job or whose role was so important and who worked so hard to win the vote. Um, it does an excellent job of talking about African American women and the difficulties they had with the suffrage movement. So I would highly recommend that. It's accessible on, I believe, through Pioneer Public Television, through Twin Cities Public Television and the general PBS website also. They're streaming it right now. So um, I recommend it highly. As far as the question of why did it take so long for women to win the vote, when the country was founded, if we start with, say, um, 1789 and the launching of the Constitution, there was really an expectation, particularly amongst the people who wrote the Constitution, that not everyone would be voting. Um, it was, there were still property requirements in every state. Um, they, they had an illusion that the wise and good were going to be running this government. That doesn't last too long. But um, what happens in the course of the next 50 years is a very dramatic shift from I don't mean to say merely, but from a Republican form of government also to a democracy. And what you find is that by 1828, roughly that's the, the election people name, by 1828, virtually all adult white males are voting. Um, people newly arrived from other countries, no matter whether they had any property or not. There are a couple of states hanging on to property qualifications at that point. But really, universal manhood suffrage had arrived in the United States well ahead of any of the European countries. So it was quite a notable thing. And the question is, if you think about it, it's another 20 years before women even dare to whisper there, or to to ask, as Elizabeth Cady Stanton does, to petition for the right to vote, or demand it, really, is what she's doing. Um, but, but it, and then another 72 years before the amendment, the 19th Amendment, is passed. So why did it take almost 100 years from full white male um, suffrage to um, the, the moment when women got the vote? And I think one of the, the key things is the existence of what were considered, at least by the 19th century, it was called women's and men's sphere. And women were always designated as, in, in um, at least European, East, um, European and American culture, as essentially private people. Married women had no right to property. They really had no right, in a sense, to to their own opinions or, or actions, they didn't even have a right in case, it was rare, but in case of divorce or separation or simply difference between the spouses, they didn't have any right to custody or control of their children. And if there was a divorce, no matter how much the man might be the cause of it, 
he still got complete control of the children. So um, the notion of it was that the husband was the head of the family and spoke in behalf of the family. But it didn't always work out that way in, in actual practice. But there was a very strong idea that women were private. They, were, they didn't speak in public. They didn't stand up and speak. Um, they didn't speak in church except with the exception of the Quakers. So it, it was, you know, that was a really long held, firmly entrenched belief. And I think that the, the expanding of that notion and the breaking down of that notion of women's sphere is one of the things that really finally shifts the country in the direction of giving votes to women or granting votes to women. Um, the, when the country began, women did not get the vote, although interestingly, briefly, they did vote property owners, women property owners voted in New Jersey. And then they kind of realized what was happening and passed a law against it. But there was one moment of that. Um, but, but women had actually been politically involved in the revolution. They'd been involved in the boycotts. They were very important as the consumers. They'd been part of the city crowds that pressured people. Um, they certainly took care of the, the home front. And they, they developed a political consciousness of their own. Um, but the Revolution didn't result in great changes for women. The one thing that it did do, though, was to, if, in a sense, elevate the situation that they were in. It didn't break down their, their kind of in, enclosure, but it, it argued that the, the people of the revolution were very concerned about replicating the revolution. They worried very much about the next generation and whether the next generation would be um, committed to this extraordinary um, experiment that they were they were undergoing. So who is responsible, of course, for raising this new generation of the Republican child? And that was women. So one of the things that happens early on is that people begin to argue that women need to be better educated. And that role of education and the development of education for women plays an enormous role in um, changes during the 19th century. The first schools for women were largely focused on teaching women to teach or teaching mothers to be better mothers and good teachers of children. Um, so they weren't particularly threatening in any way. They were really reinforcing that domestic role. Um, but in 1837, there was a great experiment at Mount Holyoke College where Mary Lyon, the founder of the college, decided that she wanted to try a curriculum that replicated the curriculum of Amherst, the male college down the road. And, um, and they did that. And that might not sound like much, but in fact, it was considered really kind of earth shattering, people still believed very much about women that they had smaller brains, that their brains were less competent, they were easily befuddled, and they, they seriously wondered, you know, if there might not be some physical harm that happened to them from this exercise of, of tax, overtaxing their brains. Turned out that everything was fine, and she made sure that they did a lot of housework and thought about missionary work so that she didn't threaten people too much, had a, a male going out and speaking to people, trying to raise money. Um, but that was a really major change, because after Mount Holyoke, a number of women's colleges developed that had at least an ambitious curriculum and an intellectual curriculum. In earlier times, women had been educated in the arts and language and kind of the, the gentler um, disciplines. But now these people were studying um, exactly what the men of the time were studying. And so um, it, it really expanded their horizons in significant ways. It's not everyone who's going to college, of course. It's a very privileged group of people. But it develops a generation by the end of the 19th century of educated women who are 
are confident and excited and in a sense intellectually all dressed up with no place to go and they um, they direct their energies to women's clubs um, which are something that that happen all across the country and um, they become involved in social reform and um, they also break into lots of new occupations. The first woman doctor got her degree, it wasn't much of a degree, in, in eight, because medical schools were not very good yet, but in 1849, I think, um, Elizabeth Blackwell. But by the end of the 19th century, there was a really significant number of women who had be, become physicians. Um, there were women who had become lawyers, and there's an, an interesting case in 1873, Myra Bradwell applied first to the Illinois Supreme Court and then to the U.S. Supreme Court for the privilege of joining the Illinois Bar. And it, this is now two-thirds of the way into the century, or three-quarters of the way into the century. The U.S. Supreme Court handed down a decision that essentially said the creator created two genders with two specific spheres. I don't know if they use that word, but de definitely two categories. And women belong in the domestic category. And yes, there may be the occasional, they didn't say rogue, but the occasional digression. Um, but basically, the, the order of nature as dictated by God is that women belong in the home. And no, you cannot join the Illinois bar. They, it, it's to, to show you that how things change, though, two years before Myra Bradwell died in, I think, 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed that decision, and she got, as, as an older lady, got to join the Illinois bar. Um, but but that, that sense of, of the courts actually saying, this is what God said, and we're telling you, that's how strong women's sphere was, and yet education was encouraging women to move um, and kind of expand beyond that. One of the things that, um, that happens later with the idea of women's sphere is that they take it and instead of trying to deny it, they expand it. And they start saying, not only is my home women's sphere, but anything to do with women and children is women's sphere. Really, they start that first with anti-slavery. Women are best suited to talk about what happens to slave women. Um, but later on, it becomes a justification for involvement in the labor movement, because women are working. Um, they're very concerned about child labor. There are all kinds of um, all kinds of justifications for it, if you want. Um, but in any case, it becomes a kind of an empowering thing. And in in 1910, Jane Addams wrote again using this notion of women's sphere. She wrote what was a very non-threatening argument for the vote when she said. Um, she tells the story of an Italian woman who lived in her neighborhood, and she said when she lived in Italy, she would take the goat to her front steps and milk it, and the milk that she gave her children she knew was sweet and clean. But now she lives in Chicago, and she has to count on the, um, the milk inspector to be sure that it's not, you know, contaminated or full of TB um, germs or whatever, and she has to vote to be sure that the people appointing that milk inspector are not appointing a corrupt person. So not only is it within women's sphere for her to vote, but it is absolutely necessary for her to be a good mother that she must vote. So by the time they get to the 20th century, they've really, they've really expanded that notion of women's sphere. And some of them have jettisoned it completely. Um, one of the suffrage songs says, let women choose their sphere. They're, they're tired of this, they're done with it. But, um, but it's a very profound notion, as the Supreme Court <laughs> decision indicates. Um, 
women, women were involved at this time period when Mount Holyoke is developing and, and the various educational institutes. They're also involved in a number of other things. They're, they're involved in um, orphanages. Um, Dorothea Dix begins her great mental health crusade during this time. All of this without, um, at the same time that they're supposed to be not public people, but they're, they're very much expanding. And then the, the most, certainly the most disreputable um, of the reforms of the age was the one that becomes most important for votes for women, and that is anti-slavery. Um, the anti-slavery movement was in and of itself very suspect in the early days. They, they were um, frequently attacked by mobs, even in places that came to be anti-slavery strongholds like Massachusetts. And um, it was all the more stressed when women like Angelina and Sarah Grimke insisted on speaking in public about what they felt they knew best, which was the situation of slavery. They had lived in a wealthy home in Charleston, their family's home, and they knew about slavery as most of the people in, in the North did not. So they said, who better than us to stand up and talk about it? Well, not everyone agreed with that um, as a measure of just how outraged people were, some people, by, um, by anti-slavery, by women speaking in public, and then also, I would say, by mixed um, populations of African Americans and whites. Um, a mob actually, while they were speaking, attacked and burned uh, the the um, abolitionist hall that they had built, because this is in Philadelphia, because they couldn't get an, in any other place to speak. So there is a lot of, this was, as I said, a disreputable movement with a tremendous amount of, of pressure. Um, in 1840, there's an important event that kind of shakes the, the attitudes of, among others, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She is going on her, her um, honeymoon trip, essentially, to the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, and along with a number of other um, American anti-slavery people. And the American women were actually going as delegates. So they all went off, and they arrived at the convention, and um, the women were asked politely to go to the gallery. They were not accepted as, as delegates, and they were furious. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband decided, well, someone better speak, so he went on the floor, for which I think she never forgave him. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, the most famous abolitionist, sat with the women in the balcony, but Henry Stanton was down below. Um, in, any way, in any case, on the way home, the women um, said to each other, they, they began to realize that not only were they concerned about the treatment of the slaves, but that they themselves were experiencing some serious liabilities for being women, and that, that there were some real problems and they needed to think about them. So they said, we need a convention of our own. It took another eight years and a few more children from, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton before they finally um, had the Seneca Falls Convention, that famous convention that really launches votes for women. And even then it was a tentative step. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the, the intellectual and the writer of the movement. And she wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, which is absolutely modeled on the Declaration of Independence. Of course, that's not a coincidence. She begins, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Um, and Stanton's first demand was for the vote. When her friend Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker, um, saw this, she said to her, Elizabeth, thee will make us ridiculous. I mean, people just couldn't believe she was asking for this, but she insisted, and it was first. And it did launch the vote. Um, it started out very tentatively, but in the early 50s, 1850s, Elizabeth Cady Stanton met Susan B. Anthony, which was a, a real kind of genius partnership. They saw, you know, they went through the rest of the century together working um, their hearts out for both anti-slavery and for, for votes for women. And from the point of 
of the, uh, their meeting, and really from Seneca Falls, women worked for both of those causes. And it was, a, that was probably the point when, when um, the women's move, or votes for women was at its friendliest towards, in terms of racial relations, and maybe it's, it's most, I would say, most admirable. There's some rather less than admirable things that, that go on later. But at this point, they really were heart and soul in, in both movements, and I think they understood them to be an issue of human rights and felt great sympathy for the slaves because of their own limitations. During the Civil War, women gave themselves heart and soul to the Union cause, and um, Stanton and Anthony were really some of the prime movers in um, petitioning for the 13th Amendment to, to begin um, and to get launched. Women had only that one political power, the petition, which was um, in the First Amendment, the power of petition, and they used it whenever they could. So that was, you know, that was their, their method. But they were very committed to that, and I want to emphasize that because of what comes later then. Um, after the war, the war was, a, you know, of course, enormously bloody and devastating, but they also felt that it was a new world. And the slaves were freed, finally, after so many years of struggle. Um, and the question of, of empowering, politically empowering, the new freed, freedmen, as they were called, um, came up. And the, the first vote was the 14th Amendment. One of the first tasks was to um, give citizenship to blacks, because the Dred Scott decision had taken it, had declared that they did not have any person by virtue of African American descent had no right to citizenship. So the 16th, or, uh, sorry, the 14th Amendment went through, and already they were beginning to talk about, you know, well, shouldn't we phrase that so that it's including everyone? That um, they were arguing for universal suffrage. Stanton and Anthony, in particular, everyone wanted it. Really, um, there there weren't any women in this movement who didn't want. Well, I shouldn't say that. Harriet Beecher Stowe was very wary about the idea of the vote. That was just a bridge too far for her. But in general, they, um, they, they hoped for universal suffrage. Um, but there was, for, and the, one of the things that was going on was that the freedmen were really in great peril. The, the northern troops were in the south, but they could just protect so much, and they were willing to protect so much. There was a very dangerous time for them, and so there's a sense of tremendous urgency about getting the vote as a protection. Um, and what they're really saying is, if we ask for the vote for both black men and all women, we simply will not get it through. This was one side's argument. The other side said, now is the moment for universal suffrage. We fought this terrible war. We've struggled all these years. Don't lose this opportunity. And furthermore, don't leave us behind when we have worked our hearts out for you. So it's a, you know, you can see both sides. There's a, and I always wonder what would have happened if, there, if they had past universal suffrage, if maybe there might, I'd, if there might not have been, I don't know whether they would have abandoned the freedmen as easily as the rest of the country did, have no idea. But in any case, I think that probably the side that said, we'll just never get this through, was right. And I think that because it took another 72 years to give women the vote. It's a much more, it doesn't seem as profound as that idea of giving the freedmen the vote, but it's, it's very visceral and very kind of deeply embedded, I think, that, that um, prejudice against women voting. Um, the, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, this is not their finest hour. They get kind of ensnared with a, an outright racist. There was a, a struggle over votes in Kansas, and he's really using them as a means of trying to keep, um, trying to destroy the 15th Amendment and, and votes for, um, for black men. Um, and there, there's a, a, an outright split in the movement. Lucy Stone, who's also a, an abolitionist, she's a women's rights person, she tells them she thinks they're, they're racist. Um, 
they say, Elizabeth, Su Susan B. Anthony says, I'll cut off my right hand before I will allow, or I'll stand for votes for the Negro and not for myself. I mean, she reached the point where she'd had it. So, so there ends up being that they opt for the, if you want, half a loaf for the, um, and Frederick Douglass, who continues to be a great friend of the women's movement, but when people, when they said to him, what about black women? Don't they need protection? And he says, yes, but because they're black, not because they're women. So he, he, he said, this is the moment. It is the Negro's hour, he said. And um, th this was a bitter, bitter split. So much so they really didn't speak for 20 years. And, and it, it hurt the women's movement tremendously, as you might imagine. I mean, that, um, that there was a lot of anger and resentment that went on. They kind of sniped at each other in, in various ways. Um, the, the Stanton Anthony wing was much more, um, much more willing to investigate kind of radical subjects and things. The other group was more respectable. But one point I want to make is that when they were in the midst of all of this, Lucy Stone was convinced that it was going to be a matter of a couple of years before the 16th Amendment votes for women came through. Of course, that was far from what actually happened, but they all thought it's just around the corner and um, instead, um, far from it, another 72 years, or I'm sorry, not 72 years at that point, but a considerable amount of time down the line, 1920. Um, so the, the movement is split. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony, on the basis of the 14th Amendment and her citizenship rights, voted. Um, she went with a number of women and voted and was arrested and prosecuted for it. And she was fined, a fine she never paid, but she was enraged by the, the vote. She was glad that she had done it. And then the next year, the Supreme Court uh, made a decision about a similar case where they say, no, the 14th Amendment does not cover votes for women. So essentially at that point, they're left with about one tactic in terms of getting the vote, and that is going to the states. In the Constitution, it's very clear that for most voting matters, the states have, have the voice. Um, and uh, so that, that was what it looked like. With the, the 15th Amendment, uh, they were able to give votes to black men because it says that votes should not be withheld on the basis of race, creed, or uh, um, previous condition of servitude. Ordinarily, votes are very much the province of the states. So they begin the tedious prospect of trying to get votes in every state. And that's, you know, that's a story that every state, I hope, is telling now because it's really an amazing thing. The women who put in years and years and years of effort trying to um, nudge legislatures towards this concept of, of votes for women. Um, the, one of the things that, that's happening during this time is that although black men were enfranchised basically through the 15th Amendment, in, after 1876, federal troops pull out of the South. And I think that the country really abandons the freedmen. I don't know any other way to say it. They, um, they're, they're sick of the Civil War. They're sick of the conflict. They want to, to get back together. The two the two um, sections of the country. And uh, they do that basically at, at the expense, it seems to me, of the, of the freedmen. And the, they say, let the South handle the South's problems. And the South's way of doing that is to establish um, Jim Crow and set up a, a segregated system. And systematically, through a series of technicalities and laws, um, disempowered, take away the franchise from African-American men. And then that, that all of those um, techniques are backed by a very terrifying terrorist movement, really, the Ku Klux Klan and a number of other groups that, you know, basically enforced the idea that if you vote, it could cost you your life or it could cost you your family, their livelihood. Um, it's familiar enough to us because we saw it, you know, it's been fairly recent history where we saw um, some of that same activity. But 
in any case, during those years, um, women, finally the two groups got back together in 1890. And then there were a few wins in the West during that time. In 1869, Wyoming um, passed, as a territory, gave votes to women. And Utah, interestingly, in 1870, gave votes to women, partly as a protection. The, the Mormons were so harassed by the federal government that it was partly a a, a protective move, but in any case, they, they did, and then later they, they um, granted votes for women when they became states, both those states did. Um, in the 1890s, four Western states, starting with Colorado, passed votes for women. So it was, it was somewhat encouraging, but you know, it's still, that's four states, that was a, a small group, and it's not again then until um, 19, 10, I think, that they begin to see a lot of activity. And again, it's in the West. Um, I, people, a lot of people have opinions about why that is. One of the things I think is, is that it's such new country and women were there and very visibly um, playing a critical role in the establishment. They were seen as the civilizers and I think that was one reason that it seemed plausible to give them the vote. Um, and maybe just the baggage of, of the, the North. One of the things, um, there, there weren't as many manufacturers and people, and manufacturers were very much against the vote for women because um, they were afraid that they meant what they said when they said they were going to have a whole new world. They were going to pass labor legislation and get rid of child labor, all these things. So there, there was a, pretty, a very strong lobby. Um, on the part of manufacturers. The West doesn't have so much of that. Um, but for a variety of reasons, those states were the first to come in with votes for women. Um, in the meantime, though, uh, though the women's movement really languishes, I shouldn't say the women's movement, I'm sorry, mo votes for women languishes from 1890 to about 1913 or so. Um, the, the other aspects of women's lives were burgeoning, that um, the progressive era is an era of great social reform. There are all kinds of activities that people were involved in, and women were involved in many of them. I mean, women were factory inspectors before they could vote. They lobbied legislatures. Um, they, as I said, many of them had gone into medicine. Women were very important in the establishment of the first juvenile court. Um, they were establishing what were called settlement houses where they went and lived um, in neighborhoods, often immigrant neighborhoods or poor neighborhoods, lived with the people of the neighborhood, um, came to understand what they needed, and were, as Jane Addams, the um, founder of Hull House said, the big brother on the playground, she said. They were the advocates for their neighbors. So that is a very active part of um, of the new woman, as it was called. The new woman was something everybody talked about. The newspapers loved her. And she was, um, she was always seen as young, although not, she wasn't always, but she was very different from the women of an earlier time. She traveled freely without chaperone. That was very unusual. She spoke out and, and wrote and spoke in public. And, um, you know, they, they were really um, experiencing a significant amount of freedom. The progressive era, in, in a lot of ways, is one of the times when women have been most powerful which is interesting because in most places they didn't have yet have the vote. Um, but it's, so in that respect, it's a time that's, that's really a um, very good time for women. They're just, they're investigating and experimenting with a whole lot of different um, issues and finding some real successes. But the Votes for Women movement, as I said, was, was languishing. And then around 1913, two things happened, and one was um, the arrival of Alice Paul on the scene, and the other was the ta Carrie Chapman Cat taking um, charge of what was called NASA, that is the National American Women's Suffrage Association. When they merged, that's what, what the name became, so they called it the NASA. Okay, Alice Paul was still a young woman at this time, but she had, um, earned her stripes 
in terms of suffrage by um, tr not training but with, but working with the most radical wing of the British suffrage movement, the Pankhursts. And like the Pankhursts, or like Emmeline Pankhurst anyway, she had been um, imprisoned and um, forcibly fed and f she, because she hunger struck. And um, th th hunger striking is a real dilemma for the people incarcerating you because they can, can't very well let you die. And yet um, when they forcibly feed you, it really amounts to a kind of torture. It's ghastly. I mean, they send a tube down your nose, and they would, were pouring eggs and milk down. And it, twice a day, she experienced that for a month. So by the time she came, young woman that she was, she was a seasoned veteran. And she was very much a confrontational person, not surprisingly, I guess. Um, so she arrived on the scene. Um, one of the things that she did, she really galvanized um, the women's movement by having a quite spectacular parade in 1913. It just happened to be the day that Woodrow Wilson was arriving as the new president in Washington. And she, she kind of preempts his, the attention given to him. They, they didn't like each other and didn't get any better. Um, but it, it was meant to be a beautiful parade, and it was for most of the time. Um, but then there, there was a, a mean crowd, and in the end, they attacked women very much with the collusion of the police who just sat there, did very little to protect them. Um, nevertheless, the, the parade certainly made headlines of all kinds, and people were outraged at the treatment of the women. Um, Carrie Chapman Cat, as a, it was couldn't have been more different from Alice Paul. She was, where Paul was confrontational, she was a negotiator. She was, um, her people she trained to lobby. And she, you know, she was a persuader. She was more uh, someone winning by modest increments. Both of them, though, came to the conclusion um, pretty simultaneously that they just had to stop the state-by-state method as the only tactic. They still continued it, but they, they had to go for a, a national amendment. That was the only way they were ever going to get the vote for everyone. Um, there were whole areas of the country that were hostile to it. Areas that we now think of as blue states were absolutely ferociously opposed to women's suffrage. Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, um, right down the line, Ohio. And, and be, because of manufacturing and because of what they had to lose by possible reforming votes that would mean you know, women being enfranchised and being reformers. So, um, so Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Catt um, mutually decided, along with everyone else, that they really needed to go for a, a national amendment. But a national amendment was was no easy thing. Um, it it's meant to be difficult. It requires two thirds of the members of the House to vote. That's a, you know, a, a almost consensus. Two-thirds of the members of the House, two-thirds of the members of the Senate, and then three-quarters of state legislatures. So it's a, um, a significant undertaking. And they knew that. But I didn't mention, too, the other area that was intransigent against women's vote was the South. And the, the South, because of a whole lot of reasons, their view of, of the federal government, for one thing, their idea of where women belonged in the scheme of things. And then above all, I think the idea that if they enfranchised black women, if the amendment enfranchised black women, they're going to rise up, rouse up black men again. So they were, the South was, was very unwilling to consider it. Um, but it still seemed like the amendment still seemed like a more possible venture than this state-by-state state, um, movement. So they, um, they launched the idea of um, the amendment, and Carrie Chapman Catt trained her lobbyists who were, um, among other things, relentless. They went back day after day after day to lobby um, members of the House and Senate and to persuade them, and to persuade them that it would be a better world if women voted, that it was women um, were, were going to get the vote, and you'd better be one of the people who helps them. And there were you know, any, any number of things, but they were, they were polite and they were um, relentless.
Alice Paul's people, on the other hand, decided, and, and Paul herself decided that they should hold the party in office responsible for not giving women the vote. And in 1914 and again in 1916, she worked actively, she and her group, against the Democrats in order to defeat them. This is, again, Woodrow Wilson, who already doesn't like her very much. Right. So, and Carrie Chapman Catt thought this was lunacy. It, it flies directly in the face of her people persuading senators and congresspeople one by one um, that the vote for women is, is an excellent idea and women are sane and rational and here you have these people out um, trying to defeat the, that party. So they, the, the two groups were very much at odds by that time. They were barely on speaking, I don't think they were on speaking terms anymore. And they had, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I'm interested in the history of reform. And one of the things that you find is that there is almost always a fight in reform movements. And you think, as someone viewing it from a nice, safe, safe distance, you think, why can't you people work together and, and fight your enemy? What are you doing fighting each other? But I've come to the conclusion that when tactics are all you have, when you're powerless people and tactics are all you have, tactics matter enormously. And in this particular case, the tactics just collided with one another. Persuasion was, if, if you're trying to persuade um, senators, including Democrats, here is this group trying to take their vote away, or trying to take votes away from them, and so um, it, it didn't work out so well. Um, the um, movement for the uh, for suffrage um, continued in 1915. There's a great disappointment when New York voted it down, but a couple of years later, New York finally comes through, and that is a major um, event when it when it happens. Um, 1917. That just after Woodrow Wilson had won again, and he won in a real squeaker of an election, it was a very close election, Alice Paul decided that what she was going to do, she and her people were going to picket the White House. They were going to be, I mean, she was, she was nothing if not public in her, in her stance, and they were going to hold Woodrow Wilson accountable by picketing the White House. So they started that, I think, shortly before his inauguration his second inauguration. And he was first, he tried to be jovial and offered them tea and things, and then it got less funny. But the point where things got very difficult was when um, war was declared, which was April of 1917. Woodrow Wilson had won on the motto, he kept us out of war, but events um, really got ahead of him, I think, got, got out of hand, and by April of 1917, um, because of, of unrestricted submarine warfare, among other things, um, the United States went to war. And once that happened, um, the First World War is the time in American history that I think mo has most outraged the Bill of Rights, um, that the f freedom of speech was simply not allowed in the the years of World War I, and it was really shame, people were shamelessly silenced, shamelessly sent to prison for sometimes 20 years for simple speech. Um, so here's Alice Hamilton, or, sorry, not Alice Hamilton, Alice Paul and her um, group standing in front of the White House picketing the president and saying, you say this is a war to make the world safe for democracy. Well, democracy isn't safe at home if women cannot vote. And there was one sign that said, Kaiser Wilson. Kaiser, the Kaiser was the German emperor against whom the United States was fighting. And at that point, crowds began attacking them, and also they began getting arrested for trespass. And the courts were handing down extraordinarily long sentences. Finally, Alice Paul was arrested and sentenced to, I think, seven months. They went off to the local workhouse and you know, endured terrible conditions, humiliating, ghastly conditions. Um, and, and Alice Paul hunger struck. And Woodrow Wilson, who was really a knucklehead about this because the English figured out you can't do 
forcible feeding without outraging the public. And they came up with different methods. But he, I, I'm not saying that he directly ordered it, we don't know that, but he certainly had conversations with the head of the prison. Um, and once she started to hunger strike, you had a choice of letting her go or, um, or feeding her. And, so, and they opted for forcible feeding. It so outraged people, even as outraged as they were at Alice Paul, they were um, more outraged by the treatment of these women. Some of them were well into their 70s, and they were just really harshly treated. Um, and, the, and Alice, someone calls them the iron-jawed angels, I think, as a reference to forcible feeding. Um, but at one point, they were so frustrated by her that they brought in a psychiatrist hoping he would say that she was insane. And then they could just lock her up somewhere. And instead he said, no, she's perfectly sane. She's just very determined. So ultimately, um, a, a, I think Court of Appeals, D.C. Court of Appeals, vacated all of the sentences. This was for trespass and possibly disorderly conduct as you were being arrested. That was the, the most that they were charged with. They were treated in very, very brutal ways. Um, and I, Carrie Chapman Catt, on the other hand, um, and her group did exactly the, the opposite thing, which was that they declared that as long as the war was going on, the NASA would support it as much as they possibly could. They would do everything they could to support the war. She had been a pacifist and a member of the Women's Peace Party. And she let that go for the, the, um, you know, the tactical move, and, which was a good one without question. I mean, people came to feel that women were contributing to the war. She made sure that everybody was aware of the connection between being such good citizens and deserving the vote. In England, Mrs. Pankhurst, the radical, did exactly the same thing. And England gave women over 30 the vote in um, 1919, so they were one year ahead of the Americans, and for much the same rationale as a kind of reward, if you want, for work in the war. Um, so Alice Paul, Carrie Chapman Catt would tell you that Alice Paul was nothing but trouble. But in retrospect, it's very interesting because her radicalism, I think, drove Woodrow Wilson into Carrie Chapman Catt's arms. <laughs> um, it's certainly, I mean, they began conversing con considerably and everything. So. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, though. You know, it, it happened that this radicalism kind of clarified things and made him regard Kat as a moderate. But that's not always the way things work. Um, she always claimed that she was the person who won the vote. And certainly those women were enormously brave. And, you know, day after day, people would appear in those picket lines and know they were going to be hauled off. Um, so they really, um, they, were, they were very brave and very determined. Um, and I think they certainly deserve some credit without question. But, I mean, it's, it's a, a, a judgment call. Carrie Chapman Catt's group um, took a different tack. And her friends who remained anti-war were heartbroken by that, of course. But, but in any case, um, in... It, Woodrow Wilson, who was a, a Southerner, somebody who was, was passionate on the subject of states' rights, um, didn't like the idea of a federal amendment for, and he didn't really like the idea of votes for women, truthfully, but um, he finally came out in support of, of um, the, the amendment, the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, as it came to be called. He didn't have any, the president doesn't vote on amendments, but his influence was still enormous. And the fact that he was so withholding on that was something that had bothered them all the way along. So he comes out and, and calls for the vote. And in 1918, January of 1918, um, the Susan B. Anthony Amendment went to the House. Now, you had to have two-thirds. And when they went in, they didn't know that they had the numbers. And it's, it's really a remarkable story. The women's movement and the votes for women's movement had many enemies, but they also had some good friends, and four of them came to vote on this January day. Um, it's really an extraordinary story. One of them 
had broken his arm and shoulder and waited to have it set until after the vote. He stayed for the entire session to persuade people. Um, and so he was one of their, their yes votes. Another one was a man who was literally carried in on a stretcher. He'd been so sick. Someone else had been in the hospital for six months, and he came to vote. And a fourth person left his wife's deathbed. She had just died, and his last promise to her was that he would vote for suffrage. So he came in and voted for suffrage and went home to plan her funeral. So it's really, it's a, it's a, a very touching story. And women were elated, all of the people supporting suffrage. And it wasn't just women. By this time, they had allies. They had to, obviously, or they weren't going to be, they weren't going to win the amendment. Um, but men supported woman suffrage because, I think, because of the argument from justice. By this time, um, there, there wasn't universal suffrage anymore because black men had had the vote taken from them in the South. But in, you know, in principle, there was universal suffrage except for women. Everyone recognized that, in a, in a sense, it was full adulthood in a civic way and that, that that mattered enormously. But it wasn't just also, it wasn't just about the symbolism of the vote. It was also that the men who supported woman suffrage believed women and, and believed the idea that it was going to be a different world when women were voting. Giving the ballot to the mothers goes the song, and, and you know, it's, it's going to be a whole new world. We're going to have cleaner politics. We're going to have, um, children in school, we're going to clean up um, you know, labor laws and the labor conditions and clean up cities. Um, all this social housekeeping, we've taken care of our own houses, now we're going to clean up Uncle Sam's. And, and I think men really, really came to support that and believe that it was also in their interests. The enemies of women's suffrage um, were very visceral about it always. Their image was of men sitting home with the babies and women sitting in, in bars smoking cigars with their children tugging on their, on their, their suit jackets, um, not able to get any attention. Um, the sense that, that somehow going off to cast a vote once every two years was going to just devastate the home. Um, but both sides, you know, really believed that something that ultimately doesn't happen was, was going to happen. Um, the, the next step after the House, the great House win by, I believe, one vote, was to go to the Senate. And the Senate, um, in the, the Senate dawdled for fully a year. Um, by this time, by this time, the um, temperance or the, the 18th Amendment prohibition had been passed without women's votes. The liquor interest never liked women. They were, they were very much op, um, enemies of women. Um, but even without the women's vote, um, prohibition had gone through. Now, um, in, finally in 1919, after the war, and with Wilson pressuring them from Versailles, where he was, he was working on the treaty, um, they, they brought or the question of women's votes, the amendment to the Senate, and they passed with it passed with 66 votes. They by the time they got to the Senate finally and got them to vote, they had their people lined up. And by that time, people like Henry Cabot Lodge from Massachusetts were thinking, this is probably going to go through at some point, and I want women at least not to be able to say I oppose them if they become a significant voting bloc. So there's a different attitude. Um, but then the third thing that has to happen in the passage of an amendment, and this is an enormous part of it, is that um, it has to go out to the states. And three quarters of the states had to pass it. At that point, it was 36 states. So one by one, the, the states um, passed the amendment, northern states and, and midwestern and western, the western states that still needed to. Um, and then they got to the state of Delaware, which they thought was in their favor, and the legislature voted it down. And they realized that the only place they had left to go, they, 
were fully aware of this was the inhospitable South. And the, the most likely place was the state of Tennessee. It seemed like if they were going to win anywhere, it was in, t in Tennessee. So in the summer of 1920, um, both sides, the, the suffrage people and the anti-suffrage people, poured into Nashville, Tennessee. The liquor interest, even though it had been defeated, was still there, throwing good parties for the antis. The manufacturers, the, um, some, some of the churches that opposed suffrage, politicians were very worried about women voting. Um, trying to remember who else I'm forgetting here. The South, of course, was, was there and very vocal. And one other group, which is perhaps surprising, and that is um, women opposing the vote. The, the anti-suffrage women's group, or groups, and they were very much represented. They were very much highlighted, of course, by the people who opposed suffrage, because what was more confounding than women speaking against the vote? There's a good article in the New York Times today on August 17th about um, the, the antis and what drove them. Some of them were wealthy women and they, you know, they had good lives and many of them were um, the, the wives of the manufacturers. But there were also, there were some women who just surprisingly opposed the vote. Um, some people who were very much involved in reform, but they just felt somehow that the, the vote was not equalizing men and women, but debasing women in some way, taking away protections from them rather than granting them equality. And it's a familiar sound to anyone who remembers the, the anti-ERA activity of the, the 1970s. Um, the, the, the other, I was surprised again to learn that Emma Goldman was a great radical labor person, was against the vote. And so was Mother Jones, also um, a, an old darling of the labor movement. Both of them opposed votes for women because they just said, it's just going to be the boss's wives voting against us. So um, there were, you know, there was a range of people, but certainly they were favorites of the people who opposed the vote because, as I said, they were so confounding. So throughout that summer, it, um, people would think, the suffragists would think in the morning that they had a vote, and by evening it would have evaporated. It was very nerve-wracking. And finally, they came to a vote on the subject. Someone moved that the amendment be tabled. And it, imagine losing votes for women on tabling an amendment. Um, and so they voted on tabling the amendment, and it lost, but it only lost because it was a tie vote. And so that augured ill for the next day when if they tied, it would be um, a loss for the amendment. So they came in the next day not knowing what was going to happen. There were two votes that they were sort of shy of. One person, Banks Turner, had voted against tabling the, the, the amendment. But they weren't sure what he was going to do. They didn't think he was in favor of suffrage, but he was getting pressure from Wilson. Um, the other person, well, what happened was they began to call roll. The other vote they didn't have. They began to call roll. They got to the B's, and they got to Harry Byrne, who was a 24-year-old man from the mountains of Tennessee who was wearing a red anti-suffrage ribbon. And he voted yes for suffrage. And they continued to call the roll, and people were really trying to figure out what had happened. They got to the end, and Banks-Turner also voted yes, and they realized that the amendment had won. And Harry Byrne went right out the back door to avoid his colleagues who were furious at him. And um, when they finally caught him, they said, what happened? Why did you change your mind? And he changed his mind because he had gotten a letter from his mother. His mother, who was herself in favor of suffrage, and she said, she wrote to him and said, I've been watching you, Harry. If it comes down to you, help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification, which is what they always said. And he said, I always do what my mother tells me. And 
<laughs> I, I love that story for so many reasons, and one of them is that there are so many suffrage songs that have giving the ballot to the mothers as one, one entire song, and there's one that says, um, son, will you longer see mother on bended knee, the sort of ultimate guilt song. So when it turns out that it is a mother, actually, who makes this happen, it just seems so fitting. Um, but if you think about it, it was hardly a, you know, rousing consensus. It was an absolute squeaker all the way through. And... Um, but nevertheless, they, they won it. So it was a, an enormous celebration for suffrage. And, um, and, and rightly so, I think, if you think of how long that struggle was, 72 years. Now, sort of to be a wet blanket about this, one of the things that happens, all of their hopes for the 1920s really don't end up being realized. Things, as they so often do, change fairly dramatically. In the 1920s, instead of being, they, they really thought that this progressive, what we now call the progressive era, reforming era, was going to go on forever. Well, it didn't. The 1920s is a very sharp turn to the right. Um, this is the first anti-red campaign. They began worrying about communists in the 1920s. There's um, it, it, it's, it's a very, it's very business oriented. There's a lot of money around, but reform, social reform is greatly eclipsed. And along with it, um, one of the things that's so disappointing is that women do not, not only do they not turn out and vote as a block, they really don't turn out at all. Um, now, I shouldn't say they don't turn out at all, but not in the large numbers that they had hoped. Um, and when they voted, they voted pretty much the way their families did. And I always think, if you think about it, it's very similar to the 26th Amendment, which was votes for 18-year-olds. That was supposed to be the greening of America. Everything was going to be different. What they found was that 18-year-olds didn't vote that much, and when they did, they voted pretty much like their families. So, so it was, it was disappointing. Um, the New York Times over the weekend had an editorial kind of shaking their finger at us and saying, don't be too celebratory about this. And one of the things that points that they make, and it's, it's absolutely valid, is that the suffrage movement, though it had many noble aspects to it, um, was not great on, on um, rights for African Americans. The, the African American women in the suffrage movement worked very hard and very vigilantly. And they were um, insulted more than once. In Alice Hamilton's 1913 parade, they were actually asked to walk at, at the end of the parade rather than with their states um, so that they wouldn't offend the Southern delegates. And um, in, when they were negotiating with the Senate. This is the chilling thing for me. When they were negotiating with the Senate in 1919, it was suggested that they should put in a, a clause that said only white women get the vote. And they seriously considered that. Some of them did. Um, there was tremendous pushback from the African American women's movement and from the NAACP, which was a newly founded organization of both black and white um, reformers, and they were, were um, vociferous about it too. There was enough pushback, so they backed off. But it's, I, I, I try to imagine what it would be like to have a vote that says white women can vote and black women can't. At one point, Alice Hamilton, talking about the non necessity for that, said, Black men don't vote in South Carolina, and neither will black women, she said. So, um, so I think they're certainly right to point out that, that um, it's, a, it's a warts and all movement. There's no doubt about it. There are, there are a number of, of heartbreaking splits. There are some real failures in addition to being not great on race. Um, they, they had some ugly things to say about ignorant immigrant men um, that makes my blood run cold. Um, and not, not always, but, you know, but it, it's a, a movement of half the population. Well, there weren't that many women involved in it. But, but, you know, it's a very mixed group of people. And they were trying desperately to achieve the vote, which was a very hard thing. So they, they considered some fairly ruthless 
policies. But in any case, the New York mm -hmm. Times tells us not to celebrate too much because this was not an end. And they're absolutely right about that. It was one more step. Um, historians criticize, too, they say about the vote that women had the, too much riding on the vote. They thought it was going to fix everything. And in the end, um, it didn't. Women, you know, sadly in the 1920s didn't even really vote. And what they say is that it took another whole movement, the second wave of, the, of feminism in the 1960s and 70s, to tackle some of those old issues of women's sphere that they didn't want to take on because they were, were so disruptive. So I would say, you know, all of those things are true, but at the same time, um, it seems to me that it's still worth a celebration because if you think about it, there are women like Susan B. Anthony who worked all their lives, and she only voted once illegally. Um, she never lived to see the vote. They named the amendment after her, but she worked all her life for votes for women, and that means she worked for you and me. Um, and I would say for all of us, uh, men and women, because I think it elevates citizenship to have everyone voting. Um, but it seems to me that we owe them a tremendous debt of thanks and that what we can best do to honor that debt is to vote ourselves and um, to, as, as they would have said, to, to ever forward, to keep moving. So um, that's, that's my story about Votes for Women and, and um, on both August 18th and August 26th. I hope you will remember these people and the hard battle that they fought and the fact that ultimately they did win it. Thank you.